fine. Um, so in that case, if the live stream's up, then I'll just go ahead and introduce the speaker uh, for today. Um, and today we have Seamus. Uh, Seamus is a member of the International Marxist Tendency, who is based in Derry, building um, the force of Marxism uh, in Ireland. So he's going to be talking about the Easter Rising um, in 1916. And so without taking up too much more time, I'll just hand it straight over to you um, to introduce the topic. So whenever you're ready. Great, great. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ray Andrew Just so, so I suppose I'll just really get kicked on it. Um, so the Easter Rising in 1916, it's really without a doubt the seminal moment in Irish history. And in many ways, you could say the last 100 years of Irish history um, are a consequence of Easter week that year. And even today, um, socialists and republicans and trade unionists and ordinary people around Ireland um, gather to celebrate the rebellion, um, its heroism and mourn its subsequent defeat. And really, I think to talk about the Easter Rising, central to, central to it was James Conley, who was, you know, he was a Marxist and irrepressible fighter for the working class, not just in Ireland also, you know, he was a fighter for the working class in Scotland, the United States, and for the proletariats uh, the world over. And really, when you're looking at the East Rising today, you know, the Irish ruling class kind of fawned over the leaders of 1916, um, uh, including including Connolly himself. And he's, he's had blessings bestowed upon him by, you know, the clergy, his name graces hospitals and train stations. And he's the subject of songs and poetry and, and television, pro, uh, television programs. But this praise really does reek of hypocrisy from a capitalist class that Conley spent his whole life, his whole political life, and struggle against. Um, and, and I think you know it's he wants to remark, you know, it, there's um, it's ironic. He, he said in reference to um, the sort of nationalists um, in Ireland at that time, they're fawning over another Irish revolutionary, um, Wolf Tone. He said, he said the following. He was crucified in life. Now he's idolized in death. And the, ma the man who pushed forward most arrogantly to burn incense at the altar of his fame are drawn from the very class who, were he alive today, would hasten to repudiate, repudiate him as a dangerous malcontent. And Conley would then add, our home rule leaders will find that the glory of Wolf Tone's memory will serve not to cover, but to accentuate the darkness of their shame. What was true then, and really is true now, I mean, um, you, you can't really exercise the Marxist content of Conley's life or ideas. Um, these are ideas that our modern political leaders look upon with complete abject fear that they might come back again today and, and haunt them, and haunt them still. And I think when we're looking at the, you know, actual Easter Rising itself, it might have seemed strange to the, the bystanders outside the Dublin General Post Office when on the 24th of April, 1916, that they seen Patrick Pierce alongside Connolly and, you know, that I'm reading out the proclamation on the steps of the GPO. Probably they were very bewildered at these two men standing there and declaring an Irish public. And it wouldn't have struck any, any of their minds when you know, you had this motley crew, and it, it wouldn't have struck any of them that they would change Irish history. When Pierce announced, we declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and, and feasible. Um, the world at that time had been engulfed in the First World War, and, and here you had the leaders of this Easter rebellion, laying bare the hypocrisy of the British government, which was sent millions of young men to die in the mud trenches of Flanders and the Somme. And they, they used the pretext of the right to small nations. Um, when they were blasting these same nations, they, uh, it was a hell with dynamite. But if Belgium was to be saved from, uh, from annexation, why was Ireland still denied its national rights after 700 years of British occupation? <clears throat> Sorry, of British occupation. And Conley, ever the internationalist, opposed this war 
and denounced it as an imperialist, an imperialist war. And you know, he had that was very much like his contemporaries, Lenin and Trotsky, and in Russia and Rosen Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in Germany. In fact, he would write in the Irish Worker on August in August 1914, should the working class of Europe, rather than slaughter each other for the benefit of kings and financiers, proceed tomorrow to break up bridges and destroy the transport service that the war may be abolished, we should be perfectly justified in following such a glorious example and contributing our aid to the final dethronement of the vulture classes that rob and rule the world. But pending either of those consummations, it is our manifest duty to take all possible action to save the poor from the horrors this war has in store. And really, um, Conley and his new compatriots saw it as their duty to take up the banner, this banner and present some sort of opposition to the brutal slaughter that was unfolding around them. And the brutality of it was creeping closer to the Irish shores. The threat of conscription hung over Ireland like the sword of Damocles. After all, um, why would Irish people be forthcoming to act as cannon father for incompetent generals in a needless war? It was also a reality that Ireland faced a very real threat of starvation in the war. The war led to a significant decrease in the agricultural production, um, resulting in an increase in food prices in England. This, of course, meant an increased demand for Irish produce, leading to food leave in Ireland. And as Conley would put it, famine prices in Ireland to be immediately followed by famine itself. The truth was that time and time again, Ireland had faced famine, despite being a largely agrarian country. In Ireland, in Ireland, sorry, an element of the local middle class and bourgeoisie wanted a, deg a degree of home rule, a local parliament not far from what devolution looks like today. And this element become, became uh, known as home rulers, and they were really the moderate nationalists in Ireland at that time. They were also radical nationalists. They were usually called Republicans, who wanted an independent Ireland, not under the British crown. Opposed to these groups were also the Unionists, and they hope opposed home rule in all its forms, and instead wanted Ireland to be directly ruled from Westminster. Most unions at that time favoured some form of partition of Ireland, um, with the north of Ireland reigning under direct British control. So for decades, the middle class home rule leaders like John Redmond, um, who, who was their you know, principal leader, they had a um, played parliamentary games with British imperialism, um, ultimately getting nothing in return. Um, and the great you know, hero of the Irish Home Rule movement in its kind of infancy was uh, Charles Stuart Parnell, who was removed as the leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, which represented the interests of Home Rule. At, and they dropped him at the, the drop of a hat when the British Liberals demanded it. And time and time again, you found that the middle class parliamentary leaders of Irish nationalism had betrayed the aspirations of ordinary Irish workers. Even now, what was during what was the most horrific destruction of human life in, in history, the uh, home rule leaders were cringingly at the back, at beck and call of the British ruling class. In 1914, the Irish volunteers were set up by the Irish nationalists in response to the setting up the Ulster volunteers by Ulster Unionists. And uh, the Redmanites would eventually seize control of all the script Irish volunteers. And when the First World War began, Redmond called for the Irish volunteers to actually go and fight for the war, fight in the war for Britain. The logic being um, that if they fought for Britain, a, a grateful Britain would then grant Ireland home rule. Of course, this whole attitude to the war boiled down to a competition between unionists and the home rule nationalists, who would really more save, slavishly throw themselves upon the altar of imperialist slaughter and more enthusiastically send young men and boys to their death. In fact, Redman said the following in one speech, the war is undertaken in the defense of the highest principles of religion and morality. 
and right, and it would be a disgrace for ever to our country and a reproach to her manhood and a denial of the lessons of her history if young Ireland confined their efforts to remaining at home to defend the shores of Ireland from an unlikely invasion. Of course, in regards to his comment about an unlikely invasion, Redmond forgot to add that Ireland had already been invaded and occupied for several centuries now. Yet here he was advocating that the youth of Ireland be sent to their deaths and uh, in aid of a conquest of yet more tar- territories. In this uh, imperial slaughter, young Irish men were just another poem. It was the defense of the Irish highest principles of religion and morality that Irish men would also assist in the death of millions of their counterparts in Germany or Austria or Turkey. So the home rulers really fought that by groveling. They could get an all Ireland home rule. So they participated in um, in this competition to ingratiate themselves with Lloyd George and Asquith, the leaders of the Liberal Party at that time who were, who were in charge in Britain. Of course, eventually the British would renege on any sort of a promise or agreement they came to with the home rulers. And Redmond would come to accept that the partition of Ireland um, he would come to accept the partition of Ireland just to stay in the good graces with um, with his masters in London. And time after time, the Home Rule Nationals would compromise on this or at that point. So so afraid were they of, of offending the sensibilities of the British and they would just completely sell out the fight for her independence. Um, on this issue, the, the issue of sending uh, the Irish volunteers to war, um, the Irish volunteers would split and out of an organization of around 150,000, Redmond took a majority of around 125,000 and forming what would then be called the National Volunteers. While the more radical nationalists, um, like Pierce and so on, would take some 15,000 with them, keeping the name Irish Volunteers, and would instead strive to make England's difficulty in the war uh, into Ireland's opportunity while England was fighting in mainland Europe, uh, an Irish rebellion could throw them off guard. And again, I mean, you have Con- Conley here, and he also rejected the sort of nonsense that was being spouted by the home rule, uh, home rule leaders and their moral justification for the deaths of millions. And Conley, like other Marxists at that time, opposed the uh, imperialist slaughter um, of millions of working people. Uh, what really boiled down to what was a struggle for who would be an exploiter in chief, German or British imperialism. But Marxists aren't pacifists either and completely understand that violence sometimes can prove a historical necessity. In order to, in order to overthrow a violent system, the bourgeoisie um, will use force to maintain its, its dominance. Um, in any sort of struggle to, to overthrow the rule. And are we to abstain from the struggle and allow that system to continue and perpetuate itself and the deaths of future millions? James Connolly on this question had a clear position and he believed that the only worthwhile fight was a revolutionary one and that an actual fact to end the, the slaughter that was going on. As he would, as he would write, <clears throat> if you are rich, are, if you are itching for a, knife, a rifle, itching to fight, to have a country of your own, better to fight for your own country than for the robber empire. If you ever, if ever you should shoulder a rifle, let it be for Ireland. It's conscription or no conscription, they will never get me or mine. You have been told you're not strong, that you have no rifles. Revolutions do not start with rifles. Start first and get your rifles after. Our curse is our belief in our weakness. We are not weak, we are strong. Make up your mind to strike before your opportunity goes. And while Conley was not a member of the Irish Volunteers, he and his comrades also formed their own militia, the Irish Citizen Army, which which was admittedly much, much smaller than the Irish Volunteers, never mind the National Volunteers number in perhaps several hundred. However, it was a much more well-organized unit taking advantage of Conley's military expertise he had gained while in the British Army. 
The Citizen Army internationally being formed during the Great Dublin Lockout of 1914, sorry, 1913, just before the war began, when the Irish working class really for the first time stepped onto the stage of history. And the bosses of Dublin, under the leadership of William Martin Murphy, a press baron and a prominent home rule businessman, uh, had tried to crush the, the work, growing workers' move, movement. Um, the bosses of Dublin had resolved to try and crush the workers who began to organise under the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, a radical union which had resorted to Milton methods such as the sympathetic strike, and it was led by Len, sorry, Arkin and Conway. Um, during the course of the strike one demonstration, suffered a brutal baton charge by the Dublin Metropolitan Police, leaving two dead and 300 injured. And this event was subsequently referred to as Bloody Sunday. And it was certainly not the last day in Irish history to be given the unfortunate name. Uh, this event in reality led to the formation of the Citizens Army. Um, essentially, it was, a, it was a red guard linked to the unions, formed to protect workers from the violence of the bosses. Um, the strike would eventually uh, end in defeat. Um, and the the, the sort of the Irish working class would sort of be sort of be temporarily put back, uh, but it wasn't a complete rout. Um, of course, the great irony of all, all of this was the fact that the employers themselves were organised in the form of the Dublin Employers Federation. Um, but um, it, it is important that we recognise the the exhaustion of the the workers in in Dublin principally. Um, in the months before the war, because it's important to consider how, how the Easter Rising would unfold later and why the workers didn't really come out and they supported. The Irish Citizen Army didn't actually disband after the lockout despite the defeat, but it continued to drill and train um, like the Irish volunteers, undertaking frequent marches and processions. And during this time, the, the two groups would actually grow closer due to their sort of shared opposition to the war and to the, the role of British imperialism in Ireland. And I seem to have moved past some of my notes here just a second. Um, yep, and, and, you know, it was their shared opposition to the role of British imperialism in Ireland and that they would start to come together. Um, neither were content merely for home rule, but actually wanted a truly free and independent Ireland. Um, so it was in this context that um, Conway now pushed for a rebellion. Principally, it was Conway. Uh, looming conscription, imperialist slaughter in Europe, and the European labour movement seemingly silent as the grave in response to it, um, or sold out to social chauvinism. Um, sorry, national chauvinism. So, uh, Conley feared that any any movement would be too late to prevent the imposition of conscription, uh, and this was the context that that pushed Conley and the ICA to uh, ally themselves with the with the Irish Volunteers. Um, as I've stated, Conley was an internationalist through and through, um, although some on the left would misunderstand his actions towards the end of his life. They argue by that by his allying with the more radical petty bourgeois nationalist, he took some sort of fatal elixir and, and the Dr. Jekyll became Mr. Hyde. And Conley was fully aware that an Irish public alone was not enough. It was necessary to fight for an Irish worker or Irish workers republic. Neither was Conley unaware of the class composition of the Irish volunteers. That, that in the final analysis, the citizen army would come into conflict with the volunteers. Conley didn't believe for a moment that if they won, all would be well and good, and that there would be an independent but capitalist Ireland. As he said, um, as he said to his comrades shortly before the Easter Rising, in the event of victory, hold on to your rifles, as those with whom we are fighting may stop before our goal is reached. We are out for economic as well as political, libera political liberty. Some 
also would claim that Connolly moved towards stagism um, at the end of his life, the belief that Ireland had to be free before you can wage an, a, a struggle against capitalism. This claim would be rubbish by his address to his comrades. It's clear that he intended to press on to the final victory of social revolution, socialist revolution. Connolly had concretely infused socialist ideas so, excuse me, with revolutionary republicanism. He saw the two as inseparable. The cause of labour is the cause of Ireland, and the cause of Ireland is the cause of labour, as, as, uh, as he would state. Contrast to some on the left today, you see the two as almost sort of mutually exclusive ideas. In this sort of Mike Malieve world, um, these, these words... Um, all fit into neat little boxes separated from one another. You're a socialist or a Republican. Um, you're the one or the other. There's no overlap. Do you think in such as is really simplistic? Consider what Lenin had to say in response to Karl Radek on the East Horizon. Do you imagine that social revolution is conceivable without revolts by small nations in the colonies and in Europe? without revolutionary out outbursts by a section of the petty bourgeoisie with all its prejudices, without a movement of the politically non-conscious proletarian and semi-proletarian -pro semi masses against oppression by the landowners, the church and the monarchy, against national oppression, etc. To imagine all this is to repudiate social revolution. So one army lines up in one place and says, we are for socialism. And another somewhere else says, we are for, for imperialism. And that will be a social revolution. Only those who hold such a ridiculously pedantic view could vilify the Irish rebellion by calling it a, a putsch. Whoever expects a, so, a pure social revolution will never love to see it. Such a person pays lip service to a revolution without understanding what a revolution is. Um, sorry, that's a long quote, but I, I think it's 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 important to, to look at it just to kind of understand um, what what Lenin's perspective on it was and why why that uh, that position is is incorrect. And there are Marxists who criticise this or that other detail or of Conley's actions in this period, um, as if we weren't. Um, he was too much too rash, or if he had only waited two years when the workers of Russia and Germany had risen. I mean, very well, that's that's all true. And it's totally fine to acknowledge all this. Our role is ultimately to understand this period and the lessons it poses today. But it is another thing um, to twist Conley into something else entirely. Conley was a great Marxist. He, he seriously tried to appraise the situation during the war. He was certainly never always correct in his appraisals, but neither is anyone. Those who think themselves great Marxists for picking out every, you know, every one of Conley's flaws um, and his being should remember that hindsight is a great privilege, but it doesn't exactly require any intelligence. Um, Often the, the contrast is contrast is made to Lenin in this period. Of course, e even Lenin didn't expect to see the revolution in Russia, even a month beforehand, um, in January 1917. He, he didn't expect to see it in his lifetime. Um, and I think, I think, again, I'm going to quote from Lenin on his perspective uh, on the Easter Rebellion. So he said... Um, it is the misfortune of the Irish that they rose prematurely before the European revolt of the proletariat had had time to mature. Capitalism is not so harmoniously built that various sections of rebellion can immediately merge of their own accord without reverses and defeats. On the other hand, the very fact that revolts do break out at different times and different places and are of different kinds guarantees wide scope and depth to the general movement, but it, it is only in premature, individual, sporadic, and therefore unsuccessful revolutionary mo movements that the masses gain experience, acquire knowledge, gather strength, and get to know their read leaders, the socialist proletarians, and in this way, 
prepare for the general onslaught, just as certain strikes, demonstrations, local and national mutinies and army, outbreaks among the peasantry, etc., prepared the way for the general onslaught in 1905. Of course, um, of course, Connolly made numerous mistakes. Um, he hasn't. He hadn't the foresight of Lenin or the Bolsheviks. Um, he didn't really understand how the working class could take part, how it would form Soviets, um, which would be the instruments of the new proletarian revolution and of class power. He did not have the luxury of a ready-made template for a revolution, and like we do today. He had to approach the question a priori by, by actual deduction. Um, of course, Connolly hadn't accept, adopted the lessons of 1905 and all their implications. Many of um, the questions that we deem solved today hadn't been solved by 1916. Um, various socialist parties um, that existed around Europe and around the world hadn't adopted the lessons of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks at this time would have been really a peripheral, peripheral grouping within the Second International, um, or really they would have split. Uh, there would have been a split in the Second International at that time. Um, but you know, within the, the grouping of socialist parties uh, around the world at that time, they were they were peripheral, um, and it was only the you know, the success of the first um, workers' revolution, the first successful workers' revolution in Russia, that these lessons would realize their true importance. And, you know, um, socialists around the world would begin to, to grasp them and their importance. But um, what, what the revolutionaries of Easter Week um, actually lacked in foresight, they made up for by and by in their determination and in their bravery. Um, the revolutionaries knew the odds against them, and when asked of their chance of success by William O'Brien and one of his comrades, uh, on the morning of the rising, Conley would reply, uh, there was none whatever, uh, and that is verbatim. And during the, during the war, it, it seemed the... Yeah, during the war, it seemed the class struggle had been put on ice. Um, Connolly wanted to set up an example to the workers of Europe and those who came behind them. Um, so to sort of uh, in, incite something. And he, he approached this unenviable task, uh, task fearlessly. And as he won't spun it, Ireland may yet set the torch to a European conflagration that will not burn out until the last throne and the last capitalist bond and the bencher will be shriveled on the funeral pyre of the last warlord. Um, and this, you know, uh, as he's making these sorts of points, Conley was a great internationalist. He wanted to try and arouse the dormant class struggle of the pro proletariat. Um, it, Conley did see events too dimly, and he, he did rise prematurely to try and that tired the prospects of cons uh, conscription and the like. However, understanding his outlook, his actions are understandable. And, you know, as Luxembourg would put it, it was socialism or barbarism. So that, that, that's what he's trying to, um, that was what he was trying to avoid. So Conley, um, Conley act, acted in this manner as he had a real class inst instinct, unlike the pseudo-Marxists, you know, Kautsky or Bernstein or whoever it may be, um, who, who betrayed the working class at this time and gave justification to the imperialist slaughter. Uh, Connolly was a working class fighter through and through. In many, in many ways, the, the rising did throw down the gauntlet. And um, it was the first but not the last demonstration of opposition to the war. Lenin and Trotsky um, greeted it very positively, defending it from the likes of Radek and Plakhanov, um, and and the kind of scope of how it was sort of um, the scope of how, how it, it made greater reaction around the world was the fact that um, it made the front page of the New York Times ten days in a row, and so when you know the proletariat had been in this sort of um, 
there been very little class struggle over the last two years at that time. It, it is it is significant that it was a sort of um, you know it's it, it stood out to the real socialist internationalists. Um, the rising wasn't completely doomed to f- failure from the get go. Um, there was something like one thousand came out in Dublin with others coming out in, to a limited degree, like Liam Mellows and Galway. Um, don't forget there were something like 15,000 members of the Irish Volunteers alongside the Irish Citizen Army. Uh, the issue was that a section of the petty bourgeois na- nationalists, yes, even of that progressive wing of, uh, the supposedly progressive wing of that um, petty bourgeois nationalist menu, um, betrayed the rising before it even began. On the eve of the uprising itself, the president of the Irish Volunteers, Owen McNeil, um, who was seen as a sort of uh, a moderate, he didn't really want the Easter Rising to go ahead. He, he gave a countermand and order um, to um, to the Rising because the German ship, American ship, which, which was carrying um, various, you know, armaments and weapons and uh, ammunition, uh, the ship was called the Bow. And, and was masquerading as a Norwegian ship, the Odd. It was scuttled off the coast of Cork, and it, uh, it meant that vital arms didn't actually reach the reach the volunteers. Um, so, in response to this, McNeil, um, whose loyalty to the you know the Rising uh, was very uh, ten- tenuous anyway, he called off the. A set of national demonstrations, which which had been set to go ahead, which was really a, a guise for the rising, and he would place advertisements in the newspapers, um, with with the countermand in order, saying that the um, procession wouldn't go ahead. So, of course, this obviously limited the prospects of the rising significantly, and any real slight prospect it may have had were just thrashed. Um. But it did mean what it did mean, however, was the Irish Citizen Army played a major role in the rising itself. Um, now that the numbers had been limited, and this is a, a fact that actually is often understated by history, and it's it's often made just about you know Pierce and and the the volunteers themselves with you know Conley and the uh, and the you know, the Irish Citizen Army just been these sort of auxiliaries almost. Um, in fact, it was not only a significant number of the actual participants of the uh, of the Rising where the Citizen, Citizen's Army, Conley provided much of the technical and military le- uh, leadership. Even Michael Collins, a future, a future Taoiseach, uh, you know, the Prime Minister of Ireland, he, he would state that he would have followed Conley into hell if it had been necessary. Now, mind you, Con- uh, Collins and Conley wouldn't have really gotten on together uh, on, in terms of politics, you know. Um, Collins was by no means a, a communist. He was he was quite right-winging, actually, in many ways. Um, so despite any, despite any difficulties of the situation, the rebels, when they did come out, displayed tremendous heroism. Um, Eventually being outnumbered something like twenty to one by the the British troops in Dublin. Um, despite that, they managed to hold off the British for several days. And um, not only that, the but the rebels caught the British army totally by surprise. Despite everything, and it took them a few days to actually sort of um, suppress it. Um, and that's that's compounded again. The kind of you know, daring of it was the fact that many of the rebels didn't even have a weapon, and if they did, uh, the ammunition was in complete short supply. Um, so yeah, really, uh, all things considered, it's it's a testament to their training, to their discipline, and the tactics employed that they performed as well as they did. Um, and no doubt, many of the articles on tactics, um, especially especially regarding street fighting that Conley had been publishing over the preceding weeks. That, 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 that proves instrumental. And by the way, those articles are available um, on Marxist.org if you're interested in reading them and maybe just seeing for yourself. 
Um, and, and journalist Connolly didn't hide behind arrays of armed men um, tucked away in bunkers or in cloistered war rooms, you know, that like um, Lloyd George or the Tsar or the Kaiser would have been doing at the, the same time. These people who played their games of war, he was actually up there um, with his comrades, you know, and, and the, and the burn away, you know, the, the gap of danger um, and, and then fighting alongside with them. And so much so that Conley was actually shot twice over the course of the fighting, including in the ankles, leaving him unable to stand. He had to be kind of, um, you know, carry, carry around in the end up. Um, and, and and alongside this, you know, despite all, all of that, alongside his bravery, he, he also displayed his unceasing wit. And he would make sure that the, the starry plot, the flag of Irish socialism was raised over the Imperial Hotel, which was owned by his own, uh, his old adversary, um, William Martin Murphy. Um, so that was a sort of maybe uh, poke in the eye for him to get back at him for the, the Easter, not the Easter Rising, sorry, the, the lockout. Um, and uh, yeah, beyond that, I mean, the, the British were eventually able to mobilize their, their soldiers, you know, and they would, they would have been able to get them into Dublin eventually. And they were just completely unforgiven in their handling of the, the uprising. Um, the British fired on the rebels with field artillery and from the gun, gunboat Helga. And it's, it, it seems, I mean, Connolly didn't expect the British to fire on what, what he would call Britain's second city. Uh, as it was at the time, um, given you know the damage it would cause to private property, investments by um, any artillery bar- barrage. However, I mean, if you actually look at it, some of his writings do seem to suggest he at least uh, he at least entertained the prospect that it could have you know could have happened, um, given it was happening in Belgium and so on. Eventually, the unrelenting bombardment left the general post office where the, the rising was kind of headquartered and where the Irish volunteers were, were defending. It, the, the bombardment actually left it in total ruins. Um, and there was you know, fires everywhere and so on. And it and just kind of became unfeasible to, to defend it. So the rebels decided they, they would have to evacuate. And I mean, if, particularly you know, during this kind of uh, stage of the rebellion is one one guy is called uh, Michael Joseph O'Reilly, but I mean he's better known to history as the O'Reilly. And the O'Reilly, I mean he hadn't originally intended to participate in the rising, thinking it was doomed to failure. Um, but um, once it did begin, he decided he would have to he would have to join the fight. And he famously stated when he arrived, well, I've, I've helped to wind up the clock. I might as well hear it strike. And yeah, during, during this, when the rebels did the, decide to evacuate, the rally led one sortie of the, the volunteers down Murrow Street, um, which is off the, off the GPO, uh, in the direction of what was then Great Britain Street. And they were intending to take William and Wood's soap manufactory as a headquarters. As it as it happened, um, the ra- rally was you know he went down the street with his handgun blazing. They actually had to charge a British barricade at the bottom of Mur Street, and what would happen? They would bear the full brunt of the machine gun. And um, amazingly, I mean, the O'Reilly sur- survived this, and uh, they, they didn't reach the bottom of uh, of Murray Street, but he, he survived, and he, he slumped in the uh, doorway on Murray Mur Street. And as he was start, sort of sitting there, he, he penned a, a last note to his wife um, to explain the circumstances of his death, and he, he remarked on it. it. It was a good fight anyway, which is... You know, it's a, it's a testament to his bravery. Um, he put it so simply, and he would he would um, survive an incredible nineteen hours after this charge, and uh, long after the surrender. However, the British just just left them there. They refused to 
offer him any treatment, even though there was ambulances and doctors and, and so on available. And um, they clearly wanted to get rid of him. And unfortunately, the heroics of uh, Conley, the rally, or other brave fighters like Gal Brewer, um, it was also you know, shot through, but he actually survived the rising. And that, that wouldn't be enough. And the eventual surrender was, um, sad as it was, inevitable. And afterwards, um, Britain would demand vengeance. And one by one, the leaders of the rising would be executed with a sort of incru- excruciating fanaticism. And no, none sadder among these deaths was the death of James Connolly. Um, again, so badly injured, he couldn't even stand the immediate fate. Uh, immediate fate. Um, the man was dying, really, but General Maxwell, who was leading this repression um, on behalf of the British, would have his proverbial pound of flesh. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's beyond callous that they would kill a, a dying man in a chair. And really, if you look at it, um, Conley's death was. Without, the, without doubt, the one that sparked the most grief, anger, and bitterness, the most evocative of all the, the deaths of the Easter Rising. And you know, despite all this bravery, it's it said that upon being escorted out of the G, you know, out of the area of the GPO by British soldiers, ordinary citizens of Dublin spat on these brave men. Um, and I mean, that may well be true. And what was then, you know, it was leafy central Dublin. But um, I mean, what of the the men and women in Dublin's liberties or Belfast Falls Road and the and these and the tenements of Ireland's inner, inner cities and in the cottages of its countryside? I, I have no doubt the feeling was very different uh, among its working class. And, and and these are the real, you know, the real people of, of Ireland. It's it's hard in its soul, it's working class who, who Conley you know, he called in his writings the incorruptible inheritors of Irish freedom. Um, you know, not like the, the middle class who sold it out again and again and again. These are the people who fought for this freedom. And these are the man and woman that Conley dedicated his entire life to, uh, his, his entire being to, and he would eventually give his life for. Um it, The wealthy who frequented Dublin's leafy city centre, who strolled Stephen, St. Stephen's Green may have spat in Easter leaders, but the Irish workers would not. Um, and in the aftermath, uh, the Easter Rising would transform the situation entirely. The brutal executions, combined with a haphazard attempt later at introducing conscription, would totally undermine Britain's position in Ireland. And in this aftermath, it would be Sinn Féin who, who would gain the most political capital of out of the Ireland. Uh, uh, so I have most political capital out of the rising, despite having really no involvement. Um, I mean, it, this was this was mainly due to the press falsely attribute, attributing the, the rising to Sinn Féin. I mean, in, in fact, if you look at it, Arthur Griffith, who would have been the leader of Sinn Féin, he actually condemned it. So it's it's really an accident of history that they. Um, they got the political capital out of this, you know. They, um, yeah, it was it was just an accident. Uh, before this, you know, Sinn Fein had hundred members or something along those lines. You know, a very small organization. And after after this, you know, they grew. They would grow to around estimates of two hundred and fifty thousand. Um, you know, as you're as you're approaching nineteen eighteen and so on, and and that this was the sort of the sort of popularity that uh, the Easter Rising spawned, you know, within a few short years, you have a total transformation and of the situation. Um, consciousness would just completely change in an incredibly short space of time. Um, and, and as you, you know, got in the 19, 1918, the 1918 elections, Sinn Féin would then win 73 out of 105 Irish seats, which was, you know, correctly, it was an overwhelming mandate for Irish independence, not a, you know, uh, not a sort of half independence, like home rule. And that, that would eventually be be won, but, you know, it was a, it was a half independence in the end up, you know, it included the partition of Ireland. And 
the, if you look at the, the tragic sort of um, outcome of this, you know, of Conley's death, was that there was no one to take his place during this period. Um, there was no one with the ideas. It, it's perhaps he's has death probably the greatest loss to the workers' movement in Ireland, and uh, the problem was, you know, that um, he had not built a, a revolutionary a revolutionary party with the ideas, you know, um, a party which could offer leadership during the, these tumultuous events of 1918 to 21. And if you had such a, if you had such a group, there's no doubt there would have been a, a social revolution in Ireland, not just a struggle for independence. And um, I mean, I mean the, everything that was going on, um, there, there's no doubt, all that was missing was the leadership. And with the lessons of the Bolsheviks, you know, in 1917 and their successful revolution, um, you know, such a group would have would have had a, a rich, you know, I mean, uh, with, with Russia, you had rich theoretical lessons that you could could easily have been applied in Irish context. Unfortunately, I mean, it just wasn't the case. And with Conley's death, the Irish Labour Party, which which he had built, you know, but it was a sort of broader broader organisation. It was a revolutionary organization, really. Um, that Irish Labour Party was found ineffectual um, during this period and was happy just to play second fiddle to Sinn Féin. You know, they agreed not to stand candidates against them. And they, um, you know, they only kind of gave them advice, you know, um, maybe you should do this, really. But the problem was Sinn Féin was unable to lead the struggle to its ultimate conclusion and it was a half freedom uh, the country was divided and you know in terms of the, the workers you know they were exploited just as they were before independence um and again you know you had partition which was a major blow to the workers movement in ireland as then as now um we're still feeling the the echoes of it today and Conley correctly stated that it would lead to a carnival of reaction if partition went ahead. And only um, a, a strong workers' movement, North and South, with a leadership that had the correct ideas of um, correct ideas and methods could have prevented this, could have led to struggle for Ireland economically, and North and South, as well as from um, direct rule from Britain. Um, and again, you know, during this period, you had um, a wave of strikes, of labour agitation, and, uh, and this was all pregnant with opportunities for the working class. It was a, you know, it was a general strike uh, in, in 1917, which, which prevented conscription uh, being extended to Ireland um, in, in the north as well. Um, you also had major significant strikes, uh, especially in Belfast. I mean, in, there was the 1919 engineering strike which, um, in Belfast, which I don't have time to go on to really, but uh, it was significant and, and it was also a major challenge to British British capitalism. And while at the same time, you know, you had this, this struggle for independence in the South and, and this strike was, you know, denounced as sort of being a Bolshevik strike. And had these, um, had these economic questions actually been linked to the national question, there's no doubt partition could have been prevented then and there. But um, you know, just to kind of come to the end, I suppose um, there are those that you, you st still separate class questions and, and the national question, you know, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's either the sort of labor must wait in Ireland, um, sort of, um, these slogans, you know, the Ireland must wait until it's freed before you can agitate on economic questions, and that, that you know, some people believe that you have to you have to fight for the national uh, independence first, or there's others who just sort of shun the national question as a sort of divisive question, um, on a, almost kind of unimportant um, compared to bread and butter issues. Uh, Conley would call these sorts. Uh, socialists, uh, gas and water socialists, because you know they would only agitate on gas and you know getting gas and water to workers' homes. They wouldn't actually bring up the, the national question. But these questions are linked uh, intrinsically. Uh, it, 
it's it's a responsible responsibility of Marxists today and to study the life of Conley and his contributions to Marxism. And that's uh, that that lesson has has rich fruit throughout it. You know, has contributions to the national question. But yeah, it is our responsibility today to, to study that, to study lessons of the East Horizon also and the wider period, which of course they can't go into, and you can't deal with in one short webinar. And really, I would say the best tribute to Connolly today would be to study these ideas and to actually build the workers' movement and um, and like that, you know, build the, the socialist future he dreamed of. Connolly's life isn't a, as in the closed book, um, and nor is the history of the East Horizon. Um, really, I would say to paraphrase Robert Emmett, another Irish revolutionary, let no one write Connolly's epitaph just yet um, until the task of liberating mankind is achieved, that that socialist dream of, of Connolly's is achieved. And um, when, when that is a reality, only then will Connolly's ideas be, be vindicated. Um, Shanae, I'll just, I'll just leave it there. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was a really great, inspiring uh, introduction to the Easter Rising, which, as we've all heard, um, this was such a heroic struggle, um, clearly. And like you kind of said at the end there, you know, our job now as Marxists is to really study that. You, you know, you mentioned that we have the privilege of looking back at what happened, not only in the Easter Rising, but then the Russian Revolution just a year later. Um, and, and that's really what we're trying to do here today with these revolution series is learn the lessons um, from these great events, but also take what we've learned and put it, um, you know, put it into action, right? Which is why we're trying to build an organization here. So I'm just going to post a form in the in the in the chat um, to encourage anyone who's not a part of our organization to to fill that in join one of our reading groups you can see the kind of uh disgusting chauvinism we're up against by some of the comments in the chat <laughs> from from one guy but they have been removed now because i mean really what we're trying to do is like like uh Shema said at the end build the kind of living expression really honor Connolly's ideas the ideas of of socialism um in the best way possible so I'm going to open uh, the discussion up now to anyone who wants to come in. I'd encourage people to use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your little Zoom screen. Um, and we can have a look through that um, and, and, and get Seamus to answer a few of those questions. But I also invite people to just also raise your hand if you want to um, come into the discussion with a little contribution. Um, so I can see there's a few people who have their hands raised. So I'm just going to start by bringing in Keelan, I believe, who wants to share with us something. Uh, if we just wait a second, we should be. Hello. Thank you so much for that, Seamus. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, just to make a, a brief brief point. Um, so yeah, you know, like Ireland um, was amongst the, the first places in the world to be subjected uh, to colonialism um, with all its intended miseries and degradations. And Ireland um, was amongst the poorest regions uh, in Europe and much of it uh, subjected to underdevelopment um, with notable and vital, vital exceptions that allow for the development of an Irish proletariat. Um, and to highlight the levels of poverty, I mean, if you look at, for instance, like there was a census conducted in 1911, and it revealed that, uh, for instance, on um, Henrietta Street in Dublin, uh, there were 835 people living in just 15 houses. Uh, and this was a phenomenon that was the rule but, uh, and not the exception. You know, overcrowding was a common uh, thing for, for the Irish proletariat. And uh, abject poverty was not the only outcome of British imperialism and capitalism in Ireland. Uh, it was also subject to the classic maxim of divide and rule, um, you know, you've got Britain's ruling class in, conjunc in conjunction with a thoroughly rotten Irish bourgeois um, whipping up sectarian division time and time again between Catholics and Protestants, uh, of which we've just seen a, a little flavour of in the chat comments there. And perhaps even more uh, divisive at the time of, of the Easter Rising was the effect of World War I uh, with how workers were pitted against each other over whether to support uh, Britain with cowardly leaders such as John Redmond uh, calling for just that. Um, and, you know, immense poverty, sectarian division and an imperialist war stood in the way of the Irish labour movement. And this is what is so inspiring about it, 
is that the Easter Rising of 1916 happened despite these immense obstacles, you know, many of which we don't even face today. Um, and workers were able to organize a genuine workers' militia and were the first to sound the bell of revolution in the world in response to the imperialist slaughter that capitalism had led humanity into. And, you know, as Seamus said, Connolly was a central figure uh, in the rising. He was, the, in many ways, the subjective factor in bringing it about. And, you know, of course, he, the problem was is that obviously he failed to build a lasting subjective factor, you know, the Revolutionary Party. Uh, and tragically, this meant that with his death, it was, it was similar to the deaths of uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht, you know, like it, it decapitated uh, the proletarian revolution in many ways. Uh, and this isn't to snipe at him by any means, you know, this isn't sniping him from the perch of, uh, of hindsight. Um, but we owe it to him and the heroic struggles of the Irish working class uh, to learn these lessons, right? And, and that's why, you know, I'd say to you, if anyone sort of um, is, is watching this and is inspired uh, by uh, the life and uh, ideas of Connolly and the, and the struggle of the Easter Rising, you know, get involved uh, in, in the international Marxist tendency, which is attempting to build, you know, and become the living expression of Connolly's ideas and his revolutionary struggle. Thank you, comrades. Thank you, Lynn, for that. I'll just make you back into an attendee. Um, and there's a few other people with some points they want to bring in. So I'm going to go ahead and bring in James, who should be now becoming a panellist. Hello, James. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, uh, Seamus, that was an absolutely brilliant uh, lead-off, absolutely brilliant talk. Um, I just quickly want to expand on what you discussed briefly at the end about the revolutionary situation that emerged in Ireland after the Easter Rising, after the October Revolution, in sort of 1918 and 1919 because what we saw there fundamentally across the vast majority of the country was a situation of dual power. You know, you had the general strike across the country in 1918. You saw Soviets, you know, workers' councils, which came in the form of initially extended strike committees and ultimately, you know, act as tools to uh, bring down the capitalist state, bring down capitalism. And we saw Soviets, uh, you know, democratic workers' councils emerge across the country, most notably in Limerick, where in uh, 1919, uh, Soviet effectively took control of the city, started printing its own currency. You know, it, what dual power fundamentally did was it posed the question of uh, who rules in society? Is it the capitalist or is it, or is it the worker? And it is, as you said, such a, a tragedy that there was no revolutionary organization uh, that was there to be able to take advantage of that situation. You know, to expand on what you said about the Irish Labour Party, Connolly certainly did play a fundamental role in the founding of the uh, Irish Labour Party, along with uh, Jim Larkin, his close uh, comrade, who also played a leading role in uh, the Dublin lockout, which you briefly mentioned. But it was very much the case that he was an exemplary Marxist. He, the problem was, as you said, he was the only exemplary Marxist in the Irish Labour Party. You know, he's surrounded with uh, people like uh, William O'Brien, who were prepared to go along with him. Uh, you know, before his death, but after his death, he said they played an absolutely reactionary role, took effectively uh, a Menshevik position of allying themselves with the petty bourgeois nationalists, with the liberal bourgeoisie uh, on the grounds of, you know, Labour must wait. That was their, that was their slogan, Labour must wait. Uh, stood down in elections in favour of Sinn Féin in return for Sinn Féin promising they'd bring in some democratic programme which would guarantee nationalisation, which of course they never brought in, you, you, can, you can never trust these classes. And that's the one thing that Connolly emphasized above all. And that's something that he shared in common with Lenin and Trotsky. The working class can rely ultimately only on itself to achieve its own interests. It cannot rely on the petty bourgeois, it cannot rely on the capitalist class. That's why you warn the workers above all to stay away from the Redmondites, to stay away from the parliamentary party. And as for you know, the volunteers, as for the petty bourgeois, as you pointed out, they're allies, but they're unreliable allies. You know, and ultimately it's the principle of uh, the United Front in the end. We will work with these people, but ultimately the working class must retain its independence. It must retain its own banners. You know, as the slogan goes, you march separately with your own banners, with your own press, with your own literature, with your own class interest, and you strike together. And that's something that we've seen um, throughout this series, you know, in the case of uh, the Chinese Revolution that we had a couple of weeks ago, the working of uh, the Communist Party with the Nationalists, and we saw how disastrous that ended up, and it was actually exactly the same case in Ireland, where it did result in this uh, disastrous partition 
which ultimately was forwarded by British imperialism out of fear of revolution. You know, it was another example of uh, divide and rule. And that, 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 may, that, that still exists in the island to this uh, very day. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, James. I'll just donate you again. Cool. Uh, someone else has got their hand up, so I'll just bring them in and then I might say a few words and then maybe Seamus, if you would you would you be happy then to answer a few of the questions? But I'll just allow um, somebody to come in here. Hello, Jack. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Yeah, great. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for that lead off, Seamus. That was excellent. I really enjoyed it. And I'm uh, looking forward to the rest of the discussion as well. I would just like to make a point that was uh, sort of emphasising what James alluded to in, the, in, in his contribution just there uh, about the sort of important link between, uh, between class independence and national liberation struggles. I think the Easter uprising demonstrates that um, the bourgeois can no longer play a progressive role in the era, in the era of imperialism, uh, and even the petty bourgeois or an extent can't be relied upon. And I think this is the essence really of Connolly's uh, oft quoted but rarely um, understood quote about you know, how you can um, hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, but until you construct a socialist republic, it'll all be for nothing. Uh, that wasn't the quote, but you, know, you, get, the, you get the sense of it. Um, and I think Trotsky draws attention to this um, uh, in, a, in an article that he wrote in a newspaper uh, called Nashi Slovo, which he released in, in exile in Paris in 1916. And uh, he explains that the chief reason that the uprising failed, other than um, a general lack of organization, um, was that the, the, the sort of, um, this sort of general national movement that was dreamed about by the Irish uh, Republicans didn't really materialize. Um, the bourgeois and the petty bourgeois and uh, the peasants as well, and, and a significant chunk of the intelligentsia stood on the sidelines really as the, as the proletariat uh, fought and died. Um, you know, for, for the cause of, uh, of, of Irish national liberation. And he, he sort of explains that the reason why this is the case is because, um, you know, a, a couple of years previously, um, a couple of decades previously, uh, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, uh, Gladstone at the time, laid the groundwork for agrarian reforms that took place, um, sort of, um, you know, uh, giving land to, um, to, to, to peasants and making them small proprietors. Uh, which was essentially Great Britain sort of placed in her uh, sort of strategic military interests over um, the interests of the Anglo-Irish landlords. Um, and because of this, the Irish farmers became transformed into small proprietors with a, quite a conservative outlook. And they were more concerned with their own small plot of land than they were with, uh, you know, romantic dreams of national liberation. Um, and on the other hand, uh, the weak Irish bourgeois who had come into the scene of history um, fairly belatedly naturally adopted an antagonistic position towards the, uh, the young Irish proletariat. And uh, the bourgeoisie's interests were, you know, were, were tied effectively to, to, um, to the British Empire. Um, and therefore the struggle of Irish, for Irish independence was, and, and still is, bound inextricably with the cause for, uh, you know, with the cause of labour, as you said, Seamus. Um, and this is an essential aspect, really, of, of, of Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. You know the idea that the, the bourgeois um, of belatedly developed countries uh, can can do nothing really but play second fiddle to a uh, you know one imperialist power or another, and this was proven correct uh, once again only six years after the Easter uprising, uh, when the pro-treaty Republicans um, representing the the Irish bourgeois essentially signed a deal with the British Empire, which made them uh, you know which made them remain a, a subject of, of the British crown. You know, and this was done in order to save their own skin, um, and they effectively turned the, their bayonets on on their, on their compatriots who wanted real independence in the way that Connolly understood it. And I think uh, Ken Loach's film, uh, The Wind That Shook the Barley, um, which is an excellent film, by the way, uh, has a really good um, depiction of, of, of these events. Uh, and it's uh, it's also got Killian Murphy in, which is uh, a good enough reason to watch it. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, this is a lesson that we must learn uh, and it's really relevant to the Irish question to this day. And this is a question that um, the Stalinists unfortunately failed to learn uh, and they ended up playing a reactionary role in the civil rights movement in the 60s. But I think that's a topic for another contribution maybe. Um, so I'll finish with this quote from Trotsky at the end of his, at the end of his article that I mentioned earlier. And he said, um, the undoubted personal courage representing the hopes and the methods of the past is over. 
but the historical rule of the Irish proletariat is only beginning. Already into this uprising, under an archaic banner, it has injected its clashed resentment against militarism and imperialism. That resentment from now on will not subside. On the contrary, it will find an echo throughout Great Britain. Scottish soldiers smash the Dublin barricades, but in Scotland itself, coal miners are rallying around the red flag, raised by Maclean and his friends. Those very workers who at the moment the British government are trying to chain to the bloody chariot of imperialism will revenge themselves. And I think that's an, an excellent quote that still sort of reverberates to the present day. Uh, so yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. A great quote to end on. <laughs> it will be hard to follow up, I'm sure. Um, so I'll just change you back to an attendee for now. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that something that really strikes me is the fact that, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, I think I mentioned earlier. Anyway, we don't talk about these things just simply from a kind of academic point of view or a, or a historical, uh, just purely, you know, interest in a, in a historical event. But I think, you know, the Easter Rising and what happens afterwards, the, the accident of Sinn Féin gaining the political capital of it and then becoming this mass force is interesting because it has direct consequences on on the, the politics of Ireland today and and the national question in Ireland and how it and how it has developed and the consequence of, of imperialism and partition and how that for years has um, kind of uh, just dominated the situation definitely in the north of Ireland for so long. I mean, this isn't a discussion on the modern situation, um, but you know, for us, what we're trying as Marxists, we're constantly looking at the roots of all problems that we see in society. And I think that um, the the consequence and the betrayal of, of middle class leadership that happened throughout the kind of the Republican cause, if you will, um, and that capitulation and how and the uh, the capitulation and the betrayal of the acceptance of part of the partition of Ireland in particular is something that, you know, as Marxists, we we look to to recognize that people often talk about bigotry in Ireland and sectarianism as though it's inherent to the people of Ireland and it's inherent between Catholics and Protestants and that's obviously not the case and we have to really expose the role of imperialism, um, of British imperialism in, in, in creating that deliberately and, and making use of that as well. Um, I just wanted to, to make that uh, kind of generic point but um there are a few questions that came through on the q a um and i can see that seamus has indicated that he wants to answer a few of them so um yeah i'll just hand that over to you if you want to answer one or two of those now um before we see if anyone else would like to come in no no problem um no i mean there's been great points um been made by the way in the contribution uh contributions and the comrades by the way um especially on land and freedom i think that's an, an amazing film I'm, I'm quite annoyed it hasn't been put on the, the films marxists should watch it and um, that's obviously been an oversight um but i, I mean I, I can maybe come back to some of those points later or whatever but i mean in, in terms of some of the questions um in, in terms someone's asking here what role did british socialists playing Easter Rising. Um, well, I mean, I mean one, one example you, you could take um, is actually the British Labour Party in Parliament. Um, they actually applauded when they heard that the that the leaders of the Easter Rising had been um, had been been executed. Um, I don't think that's necessarily something that you know everybody was applauding the uh, deaths of the Easter Rising and the and the labour movement, but I think it's, it's something you know. Um, certainly, some of the leaders probably weren't that sympathetic, but the actual ordinary people were quite. Um, I, I, would, I don't know about majority people being supportive, but definitely there would have been people um, supportive of the. The struggle for Irish freedom and so on, and that's that's something that became quite clear as you actually got into the War of Independence, and that that kind of was a very different attitude to the, the people applauding the, the, the deaths of uh, the Easter Rising's leaders in the House of Commons. You know, um, a lot of the Labour movement just as they were opposing the war and against against Soviet Russia, um, and they were you know refusing to um, you know touch goods, you know, the, the black goods that were uh, being sent to the forces of the whites or they wouldn't send guns, etc. cetera. Um, wouldn't fuel ships. 
Um, I mean, there were similar attitudes to Ireland because they saw it was was just, you know, interests were the same. Um, but that's, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that fully answers the question, but uh, I think it's, um, you know, it was fairly good um, solidarity that they were on, as, as you would have seen maybe during other instances, um, like in the response to, you know, uh, bloody Sunday or whatever it may be. I think it, it can be a mixed response, but it's it's primarily you know leaders that probably were less negative, but ordinary people I think would have been quite quite positive about um, the likes of Connolly, you know, who who had um, been in and around Britain at various points and got a quite a positive response. Um, there's another question here about the centenary kind of um, celebrations. I, th I think the Irish establishment how it responded to it. It was quite, um, like as I was saying, you know, it, it was quite, um, quite a lot of hypocrisy, and um, they would, they would um, acknowledge the revolutionary implications of it to an extent, um, but 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 not really fully. Um, I think there was a kind of. In nineteen sixteen, in particular, there was probably a bit more kind of, they felt under pressure. They, it really, it's, it come, it's it's a thing you know that they're under pressure um, from the actual Irish workers to to support it. It's it's I mean it's no different than really the the German you know uh, German ruling class during the war talking in you know, the First World War talking about a national Marx. Um, they they can't just as um, you know, these these people are too popular for themselves to kind of they kind of draw them under criticism, and yeah, yeah, that's that's the only way I can sort of describe it. It's just hypocritical, and um, they they do kind of play pay homage to them in, in a very kind of lip service kind of way. But uh, there's there's no real correlation there in the politics. Um, I suppose maybe. Uh, there's also here a question about Sinn Féin's surge in the recent elections. I mean, I think that, that's largely a, a sort of, I think that's a, that's a response to um, the kind of economic questions in Ireland, you know, over the last 10 years or so, um, the Irish working class has, has, has taken a lot of, uh, taken a lot of flack, you know, the, it has carried the, Carried the brunt of the IMF and Troika, the European Central Bank, uh, the, their sort of um, austerity you know, reforms, as they as they call it, and the Irish working class has, has paid the the rich man's bill, so to speak, you know, and I've just, I, you know, standards of living have just dropped, and those sorts of things. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that all at once um, they find their expression. Sometimes it can take a while, like in the instance of the First World War, you know, it took two years for any sort of, you know, the, the, the icy break, so to speak. Uh, but, it, but it did happen. And it's what Marxists, you know, Marxists uh, have a philosophy, it's dialectical materialism. It's called dialectical materialism. And one of the principles of it is that, um, you know, quantity changes and equality over a long period of time. Um, things can seemingly you know go on as normal um even though that um you, you know things are happening and um in the case of ireland you know the austerity is being piled on and piled on and piled on eventually the, the the straw will break the camel's back and i think the that moment maybe in the case of the recent election was when um there was this this homeless um individual it was it was an attempt or something something and I don't remember the exact specifics of the, the situation, but the, there was like a, a, a digger and, and it just kind of destroyed his tent. It was just kind of indicative of the callous um, opinion of, you know, the, the poor and homeless people and so on. You know, there's something like 10,000 on them. There's 10,000 or something like that homeless in Dublin. And um, I mean, yeah, the, the, there's just... Homelessness is a major issue. People can't afford to live in Dublin. It's it's like um, you're maybe talking about a thousand euro a month, um, or more, and just to live in this sort of 
and really the kind of like hovels, you know, which you're sharing a, a room with a few people, you know, that won't even get you your own room. And that's that's eventually um, going to cause people to, they're not going to take that at, after a certain point. And that's that's what happened in Ireland um, in, the, in the recent election. And people turned to Sinn Féin because they were posing um, a radical alternative in people's minds. Um, I suppose I'll, there's another question here. Um, one. Could a or an Irish Bolshevik party been formed? Could a, I mean, I, I think I think yeah, definitely partition could have been avoided. Um, with the right ideas, you know, the right methods. Obviously, that's uh, you know, Marxists can have a subjective factor, and actually, um, sort of, I mean, provide leadership to the movement. Uh, obviously, at different points, I, I don't think if it was a small organization um, of you know, fifty people, maybe they, they may may not have been able to fundamentally, um, you know, transform the situation. But there's, there's there's no reason that in the course of a struggle that you know that's a small group kind of growing um or even if it was a larger group that there's no issue at all and uh, there's no question about it that, that that could have been avoided um it was very tumultuous events in 1918 to 21 um you know as, as being alluded to you know there were soviets there were strikes uh general strikes um and and the only reason i mean i mean just to use one example of Limerick, i think it's quite enlightening um Limerick workers formed their own their own Soviet, they called it a Soviet, and and they um, printed their own money and so on. Um, the only reason that actual, um, the only reason they kind of they stopped organizing themselves, so to speak, or the, the Soviets um, came to advantage was because Sinn Féin and the the IRA actually said to them, you know, don't be at that, you know, um, you made your point or whatever, I, I suppose, and they, they, they just said, leave the fight in the us. And really, that just you know was a kind of lesson. People, we, we, you take a step back, and um, really, the Labour Labour Party in Ireland rubber stamped that. Um, so you know, they allowed Sinn Féin to have that sort of that sort of role where they were able to kind of have that impact over the workers. But if there was a revolutionary you know tendency or whatever in Ireland at that time. Uh, Who's to say, you know, in Limerick, they would have said, no, well, no, we're going to go on and we're, we're going to have Soviets all over Ireland. And um, I mean, that was the real fear, fear of the British, that it wasn't so much the struggle for national independence. It was Bolshevism, um, you know, around the world in Britain and ever more kind of uh, more immediately with, was Bolshevism in, in Ireland, which was a very real Real possibility where people were seizing control of land and and and, and uh, yeah, these strikes and, and about you know yeah just, um, the answer to the question quite shortly I think <laughs> it could have happened. Okay, thanks very much <laughs> uh, for answering those questions. So yeah, I'll just give another appeal. If anyone else wants to um, come in to make a contribution, then just raise your hand um, and I can promote you as a panelist. Um, otherwise, I'll just, I suppose, echo a lot of what Seamus has already said um, uh, and, uh, in, in, the, in the discussion so far. Um, and, and just remind people that, you know, really more than anything, we're not just interested in kind of general discussions, but we're really trying to build a, a real organization here. I mean, the question about, you know, would a, if there had been a, an organization, if there had been an Irish Bolshevik party formed, could the, the you know, guerrilla war of independence or partition been avoided? Um, and the role of a, of, a, of a revolutionary organization trained and steeled in the ideas of Marxism, um, understanding that perspective and understanding that theory, um, I think would have really, um, change the situation. Um, but there's no point just kind of looking back and always thinking, what if? I mean, people often say, you know, if, if only the, the Irish workers had held on another year and um, until the Russian Revolution had taken place, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but now we're in a situation um, where we're able to build an organization, we're able to prepare for events. I mean, even just thinking about the world situation right now, I suppose, that capitalism is in the deepest crisis it's ever been in. 
um, uh, the economic crisis and the, and the political crisis that we're seeing take place in loads of countries all over the world. Um, and, and so I think there's never been a better time to be a Marxist. Also, literally, given the fact that many of us are on lockdown, <laughs> um, a lot of us have more time to study Marxist theory um, and take part in, in discussions like this, which is, is obviously really important. Um, and so I suppose I can Unless anyone else wants to come in, I can, you know, ask Seamus uh, if there are any last points, any more general points he wants to kind of end the discussion on and kind of leave us with. Um, but otherwise than that, I'm just gonna, uh, oh, sorry. I was gonna post my form again, but I've I've lost the link to it. So maybe I won't, oh, I'm just kidding. I found it. Um, I'll just post the link again in the chat to see if anyone wants to join one of our reading groups um, or just get involved with any local Marxists near you. Obviously all of our meetings are taking place online at the moment um, so there's no real barriers to a lot of people getting involved um, and just to give a reminder that next week we're having another session uh, it will again be up Thursday at six o'clock and next week we'll be discussing May 68, which was obviously an incredibly revolutionary year across the world, um, in France, also in the north of Ireland at the beginning, in, in many cases in terms of the troubles, obviously we spoke about the kind of history of Ireland um, there. Oh, someone's put their hand up, uh, so I might just bring them in quickly, um, and then after that I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Seamus to, to sum us up. So I'll just promote uh, Ben there now. Hello, Ben. You might need to unmute yourself. Hey, Great. Fiona. <laughs> You're right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I was just going to say um, it's it is easy with uh, with with retrospect to kind of pick holes in the um you know the the, the easter uprising and uh yeah at the time i mean it had many detractors who referred to it as a putsch and um i think yeah lenin lenin pointed that out like there is no there is no perfect chemically pure revolution um and i, I think you have to sort of <clears throat> step back a bit for a second and think about how um how right conley was on how many questions <clears throat> i think the first point is that he was completely isolated from the great revolutionaries in the rest of uh, in the rest of Europe. You know, um, the you know he wasn't able to go to the Zimmerwald conference. He wasn't connected to Lenin and Trotsky in Russia. He wasn't connected to Rosa Luxemburg and the other great revolutionaries. And yet he came to uh, the same conclusions as as Lenin, particularly on the national question that socialists can't simply separate out the the struggle for national self determination and the struggle for socialism. Um, that they're, they're two intrinsically linked things. The the struggle of the Irish working class. Is intrinsically linked to their fight against uh, their their oppressors in Ireland, which are which is the British ruling class. It, it was a national question, um, and the the the, the Irish um, bourgeois, the Irish capitalist class, um, they only took up the national question basically to try and gain certain concessions from the British capitalist class. That's the that's the key point. They were intimately connected, and in fact, the big capitalists, uh, with a few exceptions, the majority of the big capitalists were unionists. They wanted access to the the markets of the British Empire. Um, and those that, yeah, like those that um, that uh, were uh, um, nationalists, if you like, um, were only looking to get concessions. They were more afraid of the uh, the Irish working class than they were of uh, of British imperialism. And in fact, uh, Connolly, um, yeah, Connolly wrote about this many years before. He, he says that the uh, this is in in 1910, I think it's in Labour uh, Labour and Irish history. He talks about how. The shifting of economic and political forces, which accompanies the development of capitalism, basically, leads to the increasing conservatism of the non-working class element and to the revolutionary vigor and power of the working class. Um, and in other words, that as the working class grows, the, the, the capitalist class becomes more reactionary, it becomes more afraid of stirring the whole country to revolution. Um, and I think, yeah, if you, if you think about what was going on in 1916, um, I was I was talking to I was Seamus the other day in in January 1917. Even Lenin was talking about how in his lifetime he probably wouldn't see the socialist revolution, but the youth might because all throughout the situation in Europe in the midst of the First World War, you had the elements of barbarism. The longer this wet war went on, the more tens of thousands of socialist workers would be slaughtered, and um, at the same time they could be uh, it would be the workers who would suffer from famine if that reemerged in 1916. Uh, it wouldn't be the it wouldn't be the small farmers anymore. Uh, who had had the land reform that I think Jack talked about. Um, so that it was a question of socialism uh, or, or barbarism. And um, 
the, uh, the I think that uh, Connolly understood the need also not simply to oppose the war, but to turn the war into a civil war to overthrow the ruling class. That was the only way the war was going to be ended. There were plenty of pacifists in Europe, but there were uh, who were opposed to the war from that point of view. But only Lenin, Trotsky, and a, a small number of others, including James Connolly, understood the need to turn it into a class war. But when it came down to it, he understood the need for the working class to play that sort of leading role. The question then was, um, how could the how could you sort of m marry together the the uh, kind of like conspiratorial side of an insurrection, which he understood the need for an insurrection, um, and the the mass character of an insurrection, which uh, uh, you know a mass strike to accompany it, the working class to sort of play that role, and. The, uh, that, that question was solved for the Russian Revolution in 1905. They had the example of the 1905 Revolution, where you had the Soviets, which carried out the mass character and linked, the, linked it to the conspiratorial character. And the, the Bolshevik party was able to sort of draw all those threads together. I mean, the, 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 90, the real lessons of the 1905 Revolution were not as clearly understood to the majority of the uh, you know, outside of Russia. Uh, um, um, so in 1917, they were able, with that experience, with that the experience of that defeated revolution, basically, to carry out a successful revolution. Um, I think you've you got to sort of give credit where credit's due to, to Connolly, that uh, he understood as much as he did, really. It's very easy, like, like you say, with 2020 hindsight to sort of say how things could have been. Um, anyway, that's all I wanted to say. And thank you very much, Seamus. I thought it was a really good, uh, really good introduction to the topic. And thank you, Ben, for that uh, contribution. All right, I'll just make you an attendee. Um, and yeah, I think that brings us nicely to the end of our of our session. I'll just remind everyone again that we're meeting again next week uh, at Thursday at six o'clock to discuss May 68. But just to finish off, I'll, I'll hand it back over to Seamus and just ask him if there's anything he'd like to sum up and finish the session by. And again, thank him for, for a great and inspiring talk. Oh, thanks. Um, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think. I can't say much more than what's been said. You know, there's been great contributions um, on the on the topic. You know, um, I think I've kind of missed out. There's been definitely you know people folded it on on the blanks. Um, I think really what the I think this you know what's say point that kind of comes out to me from it all is really um, you know. In terms of Trotsky and Conley, you know, yeah, there was a lot of um, overlap there. Uh, I think that was a good point that was made. I can't remember who made that point, but um, independent of each other, Conley and and, um, and not uh, you know full, as fully refined as as uh, Trotsky uh, make a lot of the kind of same uh, conclusions and in, in, in terms of uh, Trotsky's uh, per, uh, theory of the permanent revolution and that. The local bourgeoisie of uh, of Ireland um, was weak. It was kind of it was uh, tied to British imperialism. It, it couldn't fulfil its historical tasks in um, in terms of uh, freeing the country and and today more pressingly of unifying the country. Um, it couldn't develop the local industry, and that was uh, especially true after the. After the Act of Union in 1801, where any nascent sort of Irish industry was sort of um, smothered in the cradle, so to speak, you know, it, it didn't, it couldn't really develop. And at that point, you know, every sort of aspect of Britain's relations with Ireland, as in its exploitation and dominance of Ireland, became a backward sort of a relationship in the sense of Ireland. Um, Ireland just became, you know, a bread bag, basket of Ireland, sorry, bread basket of Britain. And um, it, it was just there to, you know, send food off to Britain. And, and, and um, you actually had a decline of industry, excuse me, after 1801. And really that, uh, that you know, then led on to um, the situation, you know, where in terms of the, the agrarian farmer farming and so on that also that also became quite backward um irish farming didn't really employ the same same techniques as other um as other countries like britain and so on you had subdivision etc etc and then the famine you know at that the situation where um essentially irish people just had to 
had to go to Britain to uh, find work and, and then um, be employed in British industries. And that, that was, you know, Mark's actually points it out um, quite well, where he talks about how uh, Irish people were placed essentially by cattle, sheep and pigs and so on. Um, so it was a very kind of, you know, exploitative relationship. And again, because of this kind of, and these ties to um, Britain and his small kind of bourgeoisie, it, it, it wasn't able to fulfill those tasks. So the tasks fell to the working class, the Irish proletariat. Again, as Connolly said, the incorruptible inheritors of, an, of Irish freedom, freedom. And the kind of, the point to draw, draw from that, you know, is bourgeoisie can't, um, can't fulfill that task. But in, um, in freeing, in freeing itself from you know ec economic exploitation, Irish working class will also free itself from the national sort of um, you know national domination by Britain, and that really is a you know that that has a lot of correlations to the permanent revolution, and I, I think it's something today someone's talking about also you know Stalinism. Um, Stalinism, you know, does try and 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 make Conley and the, the sort of stages. You know, he, he thought, you know, national freedom first, and then we can have the, the the economic freedom. You know, that sort of labor must wait attitude. And someone also was correctly pointing out that this this was carried over then in the civil rights movement of the nineteen sixties, and that's very true as well. Where the Stalins just had this kind of, you know unity sort of um, as uh, as their watchword and, and they would unite people like John Hume and, and so on who were you know <laughs> they were actually these very bad conservative um, bourgeois nationalists um, if you could even call them that um, and yeah I don't think I, I think it, the main thing is we have to avoid that mistake and, and, and the actual um, task you know today, you know, for the Irish working class, it actually has to achieve that, achieve uh, national liberation, but also with that uh, economic uh, economic liberation. And yeah, I, I, I think that it's only the working class that can do that. And I'll just really end off with a quote from Connolly, if I can get it up here. And this is from Labour in Irish History, which is probably his, um, his best work, and I would recommend everybody read it. I um, wouldn't say, a, you know, everything about it is, is is on point, you know, like we were talking about. Um, he didn't have insight and everything, but I mean, it's 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 probably the be his best work. So we'll just start here. So the revolutions of the past were wiser. The Irish socialists today uh, are wiser. Irish socialists are wiser today, sorry. In their movement, the North and South will again clasp pants. Again, it will be demonstrated as in 98, that the pressure of a common exploitation can make enthusiastic rebels out of a Protestant working class, earnest champions of civil and religious liberty out of Catholics, and out of bo both a united social democracy. And I think that's, that's the perspe perspective of um, the Marxist movement in Ireland today as well. Amazing, thank you very much. Always great to end on a quote. Um, all right, well, that brings us to the end of the session. So I'll just say thanks to everyone for coming. Um, thanks again to Seamus and we'll hopefully see all of you next week. All right, I'll just end it there. Bye. <laughs>
join our study groups, spread our online material, and start getting organised with us. We're faced with an historic challenge and an historic opportunity. Seize this moment. Change the world. <laughs>